Very appreciative of you, Chester. That's the first time I've ever sang that song, and it's good to know that it's right there. It's tune in. So a song that we know. Uh, we are in uh, the reading of the Psalms so far this year. Uh, we're starting this week Psalms 100, so maybe we can uh, sing this song again on uh, uh, June the 4th. So uh, we'll be into the Psalms 113. Uh, one thing that we neglected to, uh, uh, I say we, you know, my wife helps me so very much with so many things, including getting the announcement sheet printed up. Uh, one of the things that I'll, I'll accept this, though, we neglected is to mention uh, that we're starting the mid, well, not midweek, Tuesday uh, Bible study in June. So the first Tuesday in June, June the 6th, uh, we'll begin our, our version of a midweek Bible study. So that means if you're going someplace already on a Wednesday uh, in the fall and the winter and the spring months, you can still continue there. You're not missing out on in their Bible study. Uh, and you can, again, add ours onto that uh, busy week that you have. Uh, and if you're not going someplace on Wednesday night, if you're like one of the many, uh, that due to the weather and the, the sun going down earlier, the driving conditions, you can't get out at night, well then please feel free uh, to come and join with us on Tuesday. Those will be recorded. Uh, and so they'll be posted as well. Uh, so, and uh, looking forward to that. Now, I've mentioned uh, before, uh, I think just here recently, honestly, like either last week or the week before, that about Psalms 23, and how so many people uh, are so familiar with Psalms 23, but they're really only familiar with it in one context, a funeral. I, and I know that I've also read this Psalms doing some of the funerals that I've done. It's certainly appropriate. It's certainly appropriate. It is certainly a comfort uh, to the family of uh, a lost loved one who died in the Lord. Uh, however, I think because we have become so accustomed to hearing this song uh, read at a funeral, we associate this song with death. And it is not a psalm of death. It is a psalm of love. Uh, and in studying for, uh, you know, we're doing the readings of Psalms, and I'm also studying for the, the, the writings of John. So we're currently in 1 John, but I've looked at 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and the Gospel of John. Uh, and so, and of course, we're not going to do the book of Revelation, but we're going to do those works of John. And so, and I'm reading John again with fresh eyes. In the context, in the light of reading the Psalms. And so I came across something that when I was reading these chapters, we're going to be spending almost the entirety of today's lesson in the Gospel of John. So if you want to go ahead and in your Bible, all these verses will be made available to you on the screen. But if you want to turn your Bible to the Gospel of John, we're going to be mostly in John chapter 5 through chapter 8. And I want to think about uh, these particular passages of scriptures in the context of Psalms chapter 23. Now, we know that the Lord said in, on the cross, Lama, Lama, Lach, Spach, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Which is the beginning of the verse of Psalms chapter 22. And so we can see that, and that you read Psalm 22, and it is it is a, a, a literal painted picture in words, a, a, a rendering. If you were to, you know, when you're, when you're on your computer and you have vision, you can do the, you know, uh, visual repair. And it will describe what's on the screen for you. And it will, it will describe what you're seeing. So imagine if you were, if you're visually impaired, and you're there, at Golgotha, the place of the skull. And you're standing there and your hand is on someone's shoulder and you were to ask them, tell me what you see. And I can't imagine any better rendering in words than Psalm 22. And so again, we can see that the Psalms are very much a part of the life of Christ. And I think that if you read 
John chapter 5 through chapter 8 in the context of what I'm going to bring to you this afternoon. I don't think that you can read Psalm 23 in, a, in the old light of it's a psalm of death. And that you'll see it again for, in a new way. And so if you're one of those persons that writes in their Bible, in the margin, right in the notes, uh, maybe after today's lesson, you might want to write some notes in Psalm chapter 23 or in the Gospel of John chapters 5 through 8. So this lesson is not entitled Psalm 23. It's actually entitled Walking with Jesus. And we've been talking uh, a lot about that lately, and we've been talking about that in, in the context of emotions. And we've been using the Psalms and, and the theology of emotions. Um, and so when I, not that, uh, my, my daughter asked me, there was a, a very emotional thing. My daughter wrote a letter for uh, my wife uh, for her uh, graduation. And it was very touching, and I read it, and I, I was I was weeping inside, but I guess I looked like this, and, and so Kara says to me afterwards, she's like, "Did it not touch you, Father?" Because <laughs> my wife, when she read it, she bawled, she cried, and and so and I said it did, and it breaks my heart, and it's there's so much emotion in there, and she's like, "But you're not showing it," and so sometimes us guys. And ladies too uh, can have this practice of stoicism, uh, lack of emotions. But I, I, I kind of want to also say that that is also can be a guilty charge of Christians, uh, members in the Lord's body. Oftentimes, when we read Scripture, we might be breaking internally. It might be ripping our hearts to shred, but we we we're sitting there. Kind of like the, the picture that Jeff talked about, the, the dog holding the cup of coffee amongst all the fire saying, this is fine. And I want to break that. I want to break that. Emotions aren't bad. Uh, in the proper context, the emotions are how you feel. You're, you're, you're displaying what's going on internally, externally. And emotions can be fuel, fuel for change. And so when I was reading uh, John's chapter, John chapter, I mean, the whole gospel of John, but when I got to the section of John chapter 5, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm reading along, and specifically when I come uh, to the woman accused of adultery, and it just then shot in my mind Psalms chapter 23. And it broke my heart. And I wept. Wept, uh, and I want you to think. I want you to think of these passages uh, likewise as we walk with Jesus in His life. Now, I'm not going to do a whole lot of commentary on on the stuff up front. Uh, we're going to talk more at at the end. But when we're reading these, and you see in the top here, uh, each one of these except for uh, one slide that I, I, I got up here where I'll have a passage from the Psalms and then an additional thing from inside here. But, but apart from that, you're going to see John chapter 5, 8 through 14 and 15, verse 15, and you're going to see the psalm this is relating to. Uh, and then there's going to be one little section which is going to be obvious to you that you're going to see and that's obviously not from the Psalms, but it's explaining something in the end. Uh, that we're going to talk about. So in, in John chapter 5, verse 6, when Jesus saw him lying there, and he knew that he had already uh, been in the condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? And Jesus said to him, rise and take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him, who was cured, it is the Sabbath, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. And he answered them, He who made me well said to me, Take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, Who is the man who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn 
a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. And then he went out, the man departed, and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. This man was in a very, very sad condition. He was physically unwell. And Jesus asked him, do you want to be made well? And you would think that that's kind of like a, what we would say today colloquially, no duh. If, if you sprained your ankle and somebody could walk up to you and say, hey, would you like that ankle to no longer hurt? How many people would say, no, I think I'll stick with the pain. But this man had laid as an invalid for many years. He was sick. And Jesus made him well and told him to go sin no more. Unfortunately, the man then goes out and he tells the Jews for fear of the Jews that it was Jesus that made him well. And this brought us to the next point. Again, this, he restores my soul. This is the Lord is my shepherd. For this reason, for this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus. They came after him because he healed a man. He restored a man on the Sabbath. And he said, and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I have been working. It's a little bit of a preconceived or ill-conceived notion that God had to take a rest. Like he was doing yard work and he worked really hard at making reality, making the, the heavens, making the earth and making that grass and making everything green and putting all those animals there. And he's just like, oh, oh, now I got to rest. I got to prop myself up on the easy chair and I got to take a nap. That was not complex for God. It's complex for us. And he explains this to us in a childlike way. But it wasn't complex for God. And what we don't realize is after he created everything, every nanosecond from that moment till now, he's been sustaining it, maintaining it, and it survives in him. So God has been working. God is still working, continuing to work, and has never stopped working. Therefore, the Jews saw all the more to kill him because he not only broke the Sabbath, but also said that God was his father, making him equal with God. For as the father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the son, of, the son gives life to whom he will. For the father judges no one, but he has committed all judgment to the son, that, he, that all should honor the son just as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Jesus being the chief shepherd, being sent, to bring back the sheep into the fold of God. All things being committed to the Son, including the judgment. John chapter 5, verses 24 through 30. Valley of the shadow of death. Most assuredly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted to the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. I can of myself do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own, but the will of the Father who sent me. When we are without Christ, we are dead. 
Even though we're living, we're spiritually dead. And so the context of the scripture, all of these individuals that are still in their sin, they're dead. They're separated from the Father. They're separated from God. But if they hear the voice of the Son, if they hear the voice of the Shepherd, and like the sheep they are, if they come to the Good Shepherd who calls them, he will give them all. John chapter 5, verses 38 through 47. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. That's kind of a kind of a weird thing when you're thinking about that. You're a sheep, and you're like, man, this guy's standing here with a rod and a staff. Like I, I was in the military, and I would stand there, body armor, rifle, pistol. And granted, if I was standing here on the street corner like that, I'd be pretty scary. You wouldn't want to walk up to me. You'd be like, I'm going to stay away from that crazy. But when you're in combat, and people saw me, and they saw me in uniform, they were like, I can have confidence, because this man is standing there to protect me. And so we didn't, ha we didn't think nothing of it. Everybody had a means of protection. And then you're the sheep, and you trust your shepherd, you see that rock, you see that staff, and you take comfort in it. Because although that they might poke you and move you along and get you to go where you need to go, ultimately, that rod and that staff is there to protect you from the wolf that seeks to devour you. But you do not have his word abiding in you. Because whom he sent, him you do not believe. You search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive honor from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come to my fathers in my father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive honor from one another and do not seek the honor that comes from the only God? Do not think that I shall accuse you to my father. There is one who accuses you. Moses in whom you trust. For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And what he's saying here is the law. The law is that rod. That law is that staff. That law is intended to protect you and to shield you and to keep you from going into the area of the wolves but it's also your accuser for we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God none of us are righteous no not one but again in the Lord who is righteous who has committed no sin who can rightly wield that rod and that staff he will protect his flock and he will shield him with his righteousness. And because he kept the law, and we know that he knows the law, and he fulfilled the law, we as a sheep can have confidence in him. John chapter 6, verses 10 through 14. He makes me to lie down in green pastures I shall not want. Then Jesus said, make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the people, and the disciples to those sitting down. And likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. So when they were filled, he said to the disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain so that nothing is lost. Therefore, they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with the fragment of the five barley loaves, which were left over by those who had eaten. Then those men, when they had seen the signs that Jesus had done, did, said this is truly the prophet who is to come into the world. And we had a gathering over the weekend. We had a lot of food. We had quite a big, big spread. And we had a lot of leftovers. But we went to the store and we purchased that. And we fixed that. And we provided to the people who came to us. And the Lord 
He is that banquet. He is that feast for the entire world. But you know what? He'll never run out. He'll never run out. There'll never be anybody in want when they're feasting upon the Lord. When they're coming to him to be fed, when they're coming in him, coming to him to have their thirst quenched, there'll always be more. We cannot consume him. He is, he is forever and always abiding. And when we see this, and we can think about this in relation to the gospel, the gospel message is for all, and redemption is for all, and all can come to him and be fully satisfied. As long as they accept him as the shepherd and they lie down in the green grass, in the pastures that he's protecting for them. And if they do, they will never walk. John chapter 6, verse 20, I will fear no evil. Verse 20, but he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. And again, the sheep who have nothing to fear because of the shepherd who is the door. And nothing can come in without coming through the shepherd. And we too can have confidence. We can have confidence, not when we read Psalm, Psalm chapter 23, when I'm dead, when I'm dead I will fear no evil. But we can have confidence now as his sheep, as his child, as his brother in Christ, we can have confidence and we can have boldness. We can have courage. And we don't have to have fear. For the good shepherd is the door now. And protecting us now. Watching over us now. Feeding us now. We don't have to be afraid. John chapter 6 verses 26 through 27. You anoint my head with oil. Jesus answered them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man, which is one of the most common things that he refers to himself as, will give you because God the Father has set his seal on him. The word Christ wasn't his last name. It literally means Messiah. And the Greek. And from the Hebrew word, which means anointed. And just how they anointed Saul when he was king, and then they anointed David when he was king, God set his seal upon the Lord Jesus Christ, his son, and anointed him to be our king. And the seal is upon him. And just in like manner, Christ, who was baptized, and the father said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And the spirit of God descended upon a dove upon him. When we're baptized in like manner, Romans chapter 6, we are baptized into Christ. Into his death and in the likeness of his resurrection. And we are anointed with his blood. John chapter 6 verses 28 through 40. He leads me in the paths of righteousness. Then they said to him, What shall we do that we may work the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. Therefore, they said to him, What sign will you perform then, that we may see it and believe you? What work will you do? Our fathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written. Uh, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then he said to them, Lord, give us this bread always. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. All that the Father gives me will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of the one of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up the last day. 
And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I'll raise him up in that last day. He showed us the way. He came here to live that life of example. He came here to lead us to those green pastures. And if we follow him, he will take us there. John chapter 6, verses 28 through 40. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. My cup runs over. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven. The one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled amongst themselves, saying, How can this man give his, us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say unto you, Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up in that last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink, drink indeed. He who eats me, my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I have, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers ate in the manna, but are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now, this isn't only and exclusively this, but it certainly is this, the Lord's Supper. But that doesn't mean that we can come here on the first day of the week, which is the appointed day for worship, and take the Lord's Supper and go, whoop, yeah, I've, I've ate the flesh and I've drank the blood and I'm good. But this is a constant feeding upon the Lord, on his word, on his life, on his power, to give us what we need and sustain us, not just on Sunday morning or Sunday afternoon, but all hours of the day. Because we need him continually. But we can see this also instituted in the Lord's Supper in Luke chapter 22. When we remember his death, burial, and resurrection. And we remember the sacrifice that he gave for us when he instituted the Lord's Supper. And all Christians partake of this Lord's Supper. He, he, in verse 19. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it. Gave it to him saying, this is my body which was given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup, which you see in verse 18, is the fruit of the vine, is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And again, as often as we do this, we do this in remembrance of him. And I tell you what, every Sunday is a special day to do that. We don't have to wait once a year or twice a year to do that. We can do that every Lord's Day. Because every day is special to the Lord. But on that day, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And we can think back to this passage in John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verses 66 through 69. For his name's sake. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. This, this idea of eating his flesh and drinking his blood, which is too much for so, so many. And so many of them could not follow Jesus anymore. This was, this was a dividing law. And so they left. And then Jesus said to the twelve, you also want to go away. But Simon Peter answered said, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that name is what we wear today. Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And the disciples were first called Christians at Antioch. Meaning Christ's life. Wearing his name because we're his bride. John chapter 7. He leads me to the pass of righteousness. And then here also in this passage, Jesus stood and cried out. Verse 19. Did not Moses give you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? 
Why do you seek to kill me? The people answered and said, You have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered and said to them, I did one work, and you all marvel. Moses, therefore, gave you circumcision. Not that it's from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. And if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses should not be broken, are you angry with me because I said a man, because I made a man completely well on the Sabbath? Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scriptures have said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Jesus, at this point in chapter 7, convicts all of these quote-unquote keepers of the law as lawbreakers. In reality, they did not honor the law, uh, but would instead pick and choose what they would selectively keep for themselves or enforce on others to benefit themselves. And what we don't see in here is we don't see Jesus condemning all judgment. Jesus does not condemn judgment, but instructs these individuals here and us today that they are to judge based on righteous standards. And he calls us on a path of righteousness. He is the standard. The Christ is the standard that kept the law, which all people are going to be judged by, by his words. And in doing so, Jesus then cries out, to the multitudes. He cries for all of those seeking righteous judgment to come to him. John chapter 14, verses 15 through 17 and 23 through 26. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another help, that he may abide with you forever. The spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. Verse 23, Jesus answered and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and the father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words and the word which you hear is not mine, but the father who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring you to remembrance all things that I said to you. I want you to think for a minute here. I want you to think for a minute here because we're getting to the, the, the next, the next uh, chapter, ch uh, John chapter 8. I want you to think for a minute about the finger of God. Just, just hear that word for a minute. The finger of God. And what comes to mind? What do you think when you hear that? Well, I think for most people, especially people that were born uh, from the 1980s on back, they probably think of Charleston Heston's movie, The Ten Commandments. And they, they think, we don't know exactly how the inscriptions uh, the Ten Commandments was made, but we're not going to say that it's a, a literal finger, because God is spirit. But we can see that in Exodus chapter 31, Deuteronomy chapter 9, the finger of God etched in these tablets of stone the commandments that Moses took down from the mountain. We see that the finger of God is mentioned four times. Three times in the Old Testament and once in the, in the New Testament. The actual phrase, the finger of God. We see it here in Exodus chapter 8, where the magicians of Pharaoh, when they could not do the magic that God did, they were like saying, that's the finger of God. It's not Moses that's doing it. No, no, no. Don't think of him of a God. No, it's not Moses that's doing it. And we, we can't do it. 
But the finger of God is coming down and putting his finger on the scales for Moses. And is making these things happen for Moses. And then again, in Exodus chapter 31, Deuteronomy chapter 9, we see that the tablets were written with the finger of God. And then Jesus in Luke chapter 11 verse 20 says, But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come to you. And we see that finger, that same verse, in Matthew chapter 12, the same thing. He says the spirit of God. So in this, this case, they're synonymous. Because again, we're not talking about a literal finger coming from the clouds. It's not just, you know, the, the God reaching out to Adam with his finger exposed. And then we also see something similar in Daniel chapter 5 where they were having a feast and they were using the implements that God had sanctified was for his worship and they were using those for their, their revelries. And then a, a hand appeared and drew on the wall. And, and you can kind of think that the, the walls there were, were plastered and like literally ripping the plaster off and leaving the message. So maybe, maybe one of those passages of scriptures came to your mind also, apart from the Ten Commandments. But I want you to now think of another finger of God. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. For you are with me. In Psalm 23, for you are with me is talking about God. For you are with me. John chapter 8, verses 1 through 6. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning he came again to the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. I'm going to stop right there. Again, these are the law keepers. These are the establishment. These are the rulers. These are the intelligentsia. These are the academia. This is the politicians. And they've just been accused in front of the multitudes of not adhering to the law of Moses. Now, it was contrary to the law of Rome to have somebody stoned to death. So they thought they had him here. We're going to get Jesus to either keep the law and have this woman stoned to death, in which case he's going to be a lawbreaker of Rome. It's going to solve our problem right there. Or he's going to be this guy who's like, well, I don't want to be on the bad side of Rome like no one does. And he's going to break the law. But Moses, he's going to be just like us. They got it, right? The smart people, they all got together, these lawyers, these politicians, these, these thinkers. But the, Jesus stooped down. He stooped down and he just started writing on the dirt with his finger. Pretending he didn't care. <laughs> Now imagine that that could be kind of anger. Hey, hey, teacher, we came to you with a really serious thing. Pay attention. Answer our question. Now, let's go back a little bit. He's coming to the temple. Well, let's think about our God. Let's think about our Jesus. He is the king. This passage of scripture reminds me of 1 Kings chapter 3, where two individuals, two women, one had a child that died, the other had a child that lived, and the woman of the child who died wanted a judgment because she wanted to take this other woman's child, and in which case Solomon was able to ascertain whose child the, 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 you know, the woman belonged to. And so he gave righteous judgment. And in verse 20, it says, They realized that God had given them wisdom to 
judge Pharaoh. And we also have to remember that, he, again, he's coming to the temple, and he's more than just a king. He's more than just a child of David. But he's also the high priest. Now, the Hebrew people would go to the high priest in order to know the will of God. The high priest also had to offer a sin offering not only for the sins of the whole congregation, but also for himself, Leviticus chapter 4, verses 3 through 21. Interestingly also, when a high priest died, all those confined to the cities of refuge, again, a city of refuge is where you went. If you committed a heinous crime, you committed, you committed a, a crime of, of, you know, uh, homicide, accidental homicide, or something along that line. The judge could come, someone could get a judge, and they could come, and they could bring you to death. But if you went to the city of refuge, and you stayed in that city of refuge, and you didn't leave, then the judge couldn't come in there and bring you out. And when a high priest died, those that were confined to the cities of refuge for accidentally causing the death of another person were granted their freedom. They were forgiven of whatever blood they had shed. And they were liberated and they were free. Numbers chapter 35, verse 28. The most important duty of the high priest, though, however, was to conduct the service of the Day of Atonement. The tenth day of the seventh month of every year. And only he was allowed to enter the most holy place behind the veil and to stand before God. Having made a sacrifice for himself because he was a sinner, and then for the people, he then brought the blood into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled it on the mercy seat, the propitiation of God's throne. Leviticus chapter 16, verses 14 through 15. And we too can see Jesus Christ, our high priest, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 through 16, seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the veil, who has passed through the heavens. And is in the holiest of holies before the God and his Father. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold our, our fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, because he's king and he is the high priest, that we may obtain mercy and find grace in time of need. When the Word became flesh in John chapter 1, He tabernacled amongst us. God came in the flesh, and that flesh was His tabernacle, His tent. And everywhere He went, God was in the midst, and He was with us. John chapter 8, verses 7 through 12, He restores my soul. So when they continued asking Him, because He's He's drying in the dirt. He raised himself up. And he said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. And again, he stooped down and he wrote in the dirt. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest even to the last, and Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in their midst. Now, it's true. It is absolutely true. They caught her in the act. And it's absolutely true. This is a great example of hypocrisy on their part, because it takes two to commit adultery. Where is the man? It's very well that they set a trap for this one. And they let the guy go. So they only brought one guilty party. But if they set a trap for her, they're guilty as well. So certainly their conscience was bothering them. But I want to extrapolate another meaning behind this as well that's applicable to us today. Has anybody in here, I, I, I'm sure this isn't, I'm sure other people than me have had this happen. Has anybody in here had somebody sin against them? 
there would be, if, if I had to raise hands, everybody would raise their hand. Uh, I, I can't, I don't think, I don't think I've gone a day in my life where I've left my house and I've been in the presence of other people that someone hasn't done something against me, even if it's a slight sin, if we want to call it a slight sin. You know, you're driving down the road and somebody jaywalks and you come to a slowdown or a stop and they give you a salute. We've all been sinned against. But let me, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand on this one, but I, I, I know the answer. How many of us sin, some sin, and some what, on almost a daily occurrence? I'm a sinner. I struggle with it. Don't think that I'm perfect. I'm not. But when someone sins against me, and I'm like, oh, stop, stone him. Drag that person out. That person on that street, drag him. No, I'm going to stop my car. I was wrong. I've sinned too. So now it's just Jesus and this woman. I imagine, and I'm going to use my imagination here, I'm going to paint some literary pictures, and this is not an exact, this is not what we have in the scriptures. But I imagine this woman was drug out of this home, and she's weeping. And they probably weren't nice to her. They were probably very physical. Maybe she doesn't have any shoes on her feet because she was caught right there. Maybe she's only got one garment over top of her. And I imagine they threw her down in front of him. Intending for the master, for the teacher, for the rabbi to stand over here and pronounce judgment. Because they've got a lock solid case. Case dismissed. They, they, you, no one, there's no defense. Guilty. And then he ignores them. And one by one, they drop their rock. And when they would stone someone, they, sometimes they would bring their rock with them. Maybe the size of a baseball. And you can just hear the thump. Thump, thump. Thump. Thump, thump, thump. And she's weeping. She's got her head bowed. Her hands are up. She's waiting for any one of them at any moment to crack her skull. And then they're all gone. Except this crazy man who's kneeling in front of her, squatted down, riding in the dirt. Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. You go and sin no more. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. When I think of this, and I read this passage, he raised himself up. He was the only one that could have judged her. He was the only one without sin. He is the righteous judge. He has been appointed to judge. In this passage of scripture in Acts chapter 7, where Stephen is being stoned, and it says, but he being full of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 7, verse 55, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Standing, pronouncing judgment on the ones that were killing his servant Stephen. And then Stephen said, as he was being stoned to death, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. 
I see the king of heaven and earth standing before this woman who was brought there, condemned in her sin, deserving of death. And instead of death, he restored her soul. She was in the grave. And he called out to her as her shepherd. And he called her into life. And then he said, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness. He pulled her out of the darkness and he pulled her into the light. He leads me beside the still waters. I wonder, I wonder if this woman followed him the rest of her days. I wonder if she was one of the women that followed him to the cross and knelt again before his feet and wept as the man who spared her was crucified for the whole world. I don't know. I like to think that she followed him to the end. But we won't know on this side of heaven. So what do you think? When you think about the finger of God, what do you think he was writing in the dirt? Was he just moving the dirt around? Was he writing a message? When I was in Iraq, we had many sandstorms. And I was going to the dining facility late one night to get some turpentine muddy water coffee. And it was the whole thing was just covered with sand and dirt. The coffee pot, you pulled out the, the grounds, there was dirt and sand in the grounds that had been made and went through. There was dirt and sand in the coffee. And I thought to myself, well, did it get hot enough to kill all the bacteria and just dirt and sand? Or should I find something else to drink? And I was walking through there. Uh, took a picture of something I sent to my wife and sent that to her. One of the things I like to think, because we have this new commandment that God gives us in John, in the Gospel of John, and I use God in reference to Jesus Christ as God, I like to think he was writing a new commandment I give you to love one another as I have loved you. But the finger of God, whatever it was, <coughs> that message was etched into the ground that day. So when you read Psalms chapter 23, I want you to read it as a psalm of life. I want you to read it as a psalm of redemption. I want you to read it as a psalm of love. And when you read it, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me on the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you're, you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I have to ask you. Are you in the house of the Lord? Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your shepherd? We all sin. We've all fallen short. We're all worthy of death. But our Lord wants to call us out of the grave. Our Lord wants to rescue us. Our Lord wants to shepherd us and give us life and life abundantly. He has plans for you for your good. And he will watch over you. He will shepherd your soul 
and you can dwell in safety and in peace and in love forever in the house of the Lord. And you can start that forever today. I beg you, I beseech of you, if you are in the audience and you need to make your life right, do so. If you need to go to God in prayer, go to God in prayer. If you need the prayers of the congregation, come forward and I'll pray with you. We'll pray for you. We'll help you. We'll comfort you. We'll love you because we ourselves were sinners, are sinners. We're not righteous, but we can point you to the righteous. And he will be happy to cleanse you of all unrighteousness and to wash away your sins. If you have not put on Jesus Christ in baptism, what are you waiting for? I ask you now, this very moment, arise and call upon the name of the Lord and come forward and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. If either of these two invitations are applicable to you, meet me here as together we stand and we sing. I am resolved no longer to linger on my world.